Galim Foundation and Makabayan, in Georgia. I welcome all of you to the Pabilang Tayo U.S. Census 2020 Filipino Complete Count in Georgia. An informative and interactive experience awaits all of you as we exchange stories about the Census 2020 amidst this abnormal time in the country and in the world. Let us begin by honoring our beloved countries, the United States of America and the Philippines. Ladies and gentlemen, the USA's Star Spangled Banner and the Philippines Lupang Hiniram by multi-talented Filipino artist and singer, Mrs. Mackie Garcia Evans. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled banner yet wave or the land of the free and the home of the Bayang magilyo, peras ng silanganan, alab ng puso, sa dibdib mo'y buhay. Lupang hinirang, duyan ka ng magiting, sa manlulupig, di ka pa sisiil, sa dagat at pundok, sa simoy at sa langit mo. How may dilag ang tula at awit sa paglayang minamahal ang kislap ng watawat mo'y tagumpay na nagniningning ang bituin at araw niya kailan pag may di magdidilim lupa ng araw ng luwal hati pagsinta buhay ay langit sa piling mo Aming ligaya ng pag may mga api ang mamatay ng dahil sa iyo. Thank you. My name is Mackie and I'm from Cumming, Georgia. My name is Isa Thompson, Director of Arts and Culture of Galin Foundation Incorporated and your host for this evening's webinar. On behalf of Galing Foundation and Makabayan, Georgia, I thank you for being with us and joining us in this virtual experience. Mabuhay po kayong lahat. And I warmly welcome all of you to this timely and very important virtual experience. Know that each of you are an important part of this program's success. So marami salamat po, and thank you again for taking time to participate. Two weeks ago, our friends from the Sense of our Distinguished Panel in this evening's forum had reached out to GFI Executive Director Tony Lutgers regarding the possibility of connecting with Georgia's PhilAm community and providing most recent updates and additional information related to the U.S. Census 2020. 
in close partnership with Makabayan and Georgia Incorporated, this webinar entitled Pabilang Tayo was conceived for the main purpose of providing a virtual platform of disseminating updated information regarding Census 2020 and further promoting awareness and importance of active and timely participation, submission of the completed Census 2020 form. Responding to the Census is a civic duty of each of us, first and foremost, of every individual living in the United States. Census information affects the amount of government funding our community receives for services such as education, roads and bridges, healthcare, safety and security services, among others, including government representation. Census information are used as well in planning new homes and businesses and improving neighborhoods. Evidently, an accurate census count cannot be overemphasized. Moreover, all census information collected are protected by strict confidentiality federal laws, Title 13 of the U.S. Code. The recent COVID-19 pandemic has significantly upended the many events, wonderful events planned for a successful data collection to say the least. As the country is slowly but surely adopting to the changing times, our distinguished panelists this evening, representing the Census Bureau and Philam community leaders participating in this webinar will share Census 2020 related updates and share many success stories they have thus far experienced. Humor for all. At the outset, I was skeptical in my ability to play an effective role in any project promised on such a dry subject matter as a census. I realized too quickly that my own ignorance and ambivalence for this matter were the deterrents I needed to overcome in order to fulfill a very important civic duty, to say the least. Having said that, yes, my family and I have fulfilled our civic duty by submitting the census 20 census form in early March 2020. And yes, I do encourage everyone to step up without fear and to fulfill your civic duty. Let us all be counted now. Complete the census 2020. It only takes a few minutes of your time. I am happy to host this webinar on behalf of my fellow committee members representing GFI and Makabayan. We are truly honored with the presence and live participation of distinguished speakers, panelists, community leaders, and our beloved youths who are the promising and future leaders of the film community. A virtual program has been shared to all of you as a reference, you know, as we proceed with this program. I humbly ask everyone for to be respectful of one another by refraining from talking over or interjecting during a speaker's turn to speak. During the panel discussion, live attendees and silent attendees through the chat reply will have their own chance to ask a question directed to any of the invited panelists. We are fortunate to have the support of our beloved honorary consul, Raul Donato, who will deliver a video message to all of us. We are truly honored and excited as well to have the live presence of a young, good-looking fellow of Filipino heritage, Sariling Aten, Ikanga, and a promising state leader Marvin Lim, who will share stories of his amazing journey towards becoming who he is now. Watch out for our trivia intermission numbers when we can twist your brains and challenge it and award amazing prizes. So 
ladies and gentlemen, sit back, relax, you know, let's tell stories, grab your favorite beverage. I'm doing water this time, and let's enjoy the webinar. At this point, I would like to call on our distinguished panelists to share their, their stories. May I respectfully ask Eleanor May Pasquale to start, followed by Tina Wen and Luke Wen. Distinguished panelists, kindly introduce yourself by stating your preferred name to be addressed as during the panel discussion and a brief description of your profession. Ladies and gentlemen, Eleanor May Pasquale. Good evening. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, I can be, you may call me Eleanor. Uh, that is my uh, professional name, I'm Eleanor May Pasquale, but of course my friends call me May. Um, and I'm the Community Affairs Director of Makabayan Georgia, Inc. And it's been my privilege to serve as chairperson of the Filipino Complete Count Committee here in Georgia for Census 2020. I am a retired paralegal, but uh, I have not retired yet from my community involvements. Just a bit of background. I immigrated from the, the Philippines to the United States in 1979 and settled here in the Atlanta area ever since. That means I have participated uh, in the U.S. Census count five times already ever since uh, 1980. However, it was only 10 years ago that I became much more aware and became better informed about the importance of the census. And I volunteered that year in 2010 uh, with the US Census Bureau in its outreach to the Asian community, particularly to the Filipino community. According to the 2010 census, Filipinos are the fifth largest Asian group in Georgia. Uh, so, excuse me. However, it, it is believed that our Filipino community is not properly counted. And it, in fact, it is vastly undercounted in the US Census. In August of last year, we started organizing a Filipino Complete Count Committee consisting of leaders and representatives from uh, different Filipino uh, American community organizations in Georgia. It was very important that people heard from trusted voices in our community. Our goal was to raise awareness of the importance of the census and ultimately ensure that all Filipinos in Georgia, regardless of age and immigration status, uh, will be counted for census 2020. We work very closely with the Georgia AAPI Complete Count Committee, which is headed by the Center for Pan-Asian Community Services and the Asian Americans Advancing Justice Atlanta and of course with our uh, partners with the U.S. Census, uh, Tina Nguyen and uh, Anne Nguyen. Our main strategy was to speak directly to our community at various Filipino events, big or small, and sharing with, sharing with and educating um, people in our various uh, circles of influence and also through social media. Um, at this time, I would like to share a few pictures of some of the events that, where we had the opportunity to do census outreach uh, in our Filipino community. Yes. Yes. Uh, okay. So um, on this first picture, uh, we have uh, a group of our uh, uh, Filipino uh, leaders in the community uh, where we had a training uh, conducted by uh, US Census and the uh, CPACs. And that was at the CPEX office, October 1st. And this is a picture of our, our Georgia AAPI Complete Count Committee. And uh, there's a couple of us representing the Filipino community. And this was another training that we had at uh, CPEX. Uh, this is a Philam. Uh, uh, picnic. Uh, we had uh, the first chance, first opportunity to wear our census sashes. It says, "Ask me about census." 
Um, and Galing Foundation hosted a Philippine American History Month celebration uh, on October 19th, and I had the opportunity to speak about census. And this was our census display table at that event. Uh, and this is a PACA members meeting, again, an opportunity to share about census that day, October 29th. Uh, Sarah and I also uh, had an event on, in November and um, I had another presentation then. This is with the Philippine Nurses Association of Georgia. And here's uh, Tina Wynn and Luke Wynn who uh, did a, a training over um, at, um, in Macon, Georgia. This is with the, um, let's see, this is the group picture uh, with the new Filipino association there called Association of Filipinos and Friends of Georgia. Another presentation at a seminar with PAPGA. Some of the giveaways from US Census. The Philippine American Center of Georgia also had a Thanksgiving event and we had the opportunity to share uh, about census. And here is Pia Valeriano, one of our members making the presentation, November 23rd. Um, this was at the uh, PAWAG event on November, uh, December 6th and we had our census uh, partners there had a table. And here's Anne-Marie Lagarda, who is the uh, Kalayan Committee Chair and PACA President with uh, Luke Ann Wynn and uh, Tina Wynn. And in this, this picture, uh, we have KV Vu, and she's with Wake Up Atlanta. And uh, we work with her in producing a video, a Tagalog video um, for our community. And here's uh, Miss Pia Valeriano during the taping. Uh, you all probably have uh, seen this video and we've been uh, pr um, promoting this in social media. Kumusta kayo mga kabayan? Taon-taon, ang Estados Unidos ay may 800 bilyong dolyar na nakatabi para sa mga paaralan, mga kalsada, mga ospital, at iba pang mahalagang bagay na ginagamit natin na araw-araw. Pero, paano nila pinagpapasihan kung saan gagastusin ito? Sa, sa pamamagitan ng, ng census. And that is a, uh, I think a three Kumusta screen. Kayo, mga video. kabayan? And even at the hockey game, Atlanta Gladiators, uh, we uh, had a presence there uh, from the Filipino community talking about census. The annual Santa Nino Fiesta, we had our uh, a team of our volunteers also presenting about census, as you can see. Um, and so it's not just in the big events, even in small events like this, where there's a gathering of friends at a home, uh, they don't uh, you know, miss the opportunity to share about census and educate our friends and families. And here's Randy Cabano at a Couples for Christ event, um, also doing a census presentation in February. And Philam Association of Greater Atlanta, it's actually our uh, biggest uh, Philam organization, I think, in Georgia. And there's Lolit Elliott and Vendi doing the presentation. And we also did um, uh, meetings at churches, Filipino American Christian Church, uh, the Clarkson International Bible Church, and also with John Newman uh, Catholic Church. So uh, we, we try to, uh, to do and to schedule meetings at the different churches here in Georgia. And this was at the Panaga Induction Ball. <clears throat> and um, Ms. Vendi Soriano and Lolly Elliott were uh, very, um, really active in promoting census, as you can see. Um, there's Ms. Vendi Soriano doing that presentation. Oops, uh, you know, I think that was the last this was the last uh, event that where we had a big, you know, gathering of Filipinos. And uh, uh, so we had to cancel so many events in April and May. Um, we even uh, planned a bus tour with uh, 
with our uh, US Census partners uh, to go to other uh, towns like uh, Athens, Augusta, and Warner Robins, Columbus, and Savannah, but that was canceled. And so we had to resort to um, uh, social media, doing personal, you know, appeals and, and um, education just through uh, our own contacts in social media. So that's what we've done. And thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share. Uh, I would like to give the floor now to Tina and Luke Wen from the Census Bureau to give us uh, stories from the government regarding the Census 2020. Take it away, Tina. Thank you, Isa. Um, my name is Tina Nguyen. I am a partnership specialist at the U.S. Census. Like the name, um, the title um, suggests, I build partnerships. And uh, I would like to thank Eleanor, Dee Dee, Willie, and Isa, uh, Isa, and of course, Tony, and everyone from the Filipino community working together to make sure that our community um, is counted for 2020. And of course, without Eleanor um, being the chair of um, the Filipino CCC for the 2020 census, I mean, you've seen the work and that she showed the dedication that the community working together to promote and share the census matching without her, it won't be possible. Um, but yes, I am a partnership specialist of US Census. My job is work with community leaders as well as the local government to raise awareness of the importance of the census as well why it's important for everyone is counted and so we are now nearing the end but not there yet it's still going on the 2020 census is going on so that's why we're here we want to make sure we get the last push and get the uh, community counted actually for the next 10 years All right thank you hello everyone this is luke speaking uh, while Tina pulling up the PowerPoint, I'd like to, um, to say a few words. And then first of all, I'd like to say thank you uh, to everyone, especially Isa and Tony and May, and of course, uh, our wonderful Willie Blanco and Leah for the wonderful videos. Um, uh, well, thank you for bringing us uh, back here uh, on the webinar and uh, interacting with the community. And thank you, Isa, for the eloquent opening remarks. I mean, you sound very pres presidential to me. And uh, thank you for that. And, um, and May, the PowerPoint presentation, it brings back a lot of sweet memories. And look, we have traveled so much and so far. I wish you throw in some uh, pictures that we had back in the 2010. And uh, by the way, that was when I started working with um, Eleanor, and uh, who I dearly call uh, May. And um, uh, I started out as just like Tina now as a partnership specialist working with uh, Asian populations uh, uh, groups across the state and the region. Back then, the Atlanta census region covers only three states, which are uh, Florida, Georgia, and Alabama. Now we are expanded. And, and included four more states, which are North and South Carolina, Mississippi, and um, Louisiana. And my job as a part of, as a data dissemination specialist was to engage with uh, community and uh, data users across this region in providing data training and uh, data training, understanding about census data or where to find census data, how to access census data, what tools to use. Uh, that's very much my involvement right now <clears throat> with the population. So for my short presentation today, I want to sort of set the tone for our uh, discussion uh, <clears throat> uh, moving forward. And I'll have a couple slides just quickly uh, give you a sort of an update on the uh, the number of Filipino populations in the United States, especially in Georgia, and what are the sticking points, what are the pain points, or what are the key points that, uh, as we uh, reach, um, as we conduct our promotion and outreach to Filipino communities, and what's the difference in terms of speaking to uh, the 
people of Filipino descendants as versus two Vietnamese or Korean. And that's going to bring into that panel discussion that Tina is going to speak further on that next. So just in a nutshell, and just go ahead, and, and you can see that Filipinos is the second largest uh, Asian population group in the United States, right? And it comprises of 20% of all the Asian. Uh, and then if you look like, at the Asian population in the United States, 88% of all of Asian Americans are made up of six major groups, which are Chinese, Filipino, Asian, Indian. And uh, some people also refer to them as South Asian, or, or, it, or what the sense of using the term Asian Indian, Vietnamese, Korean, and Japanese. Next. Now, when it comes to Georgia, uh, the 2010 census reported Georgia were the fifth largest Asian group in the uh, in the state of Georgia, that uh, and but then moving forward, uh, by the 2017 American Community Survey, we can see that there's a quite an increase of Filipino American population there. We are at 20, about 22,000, but more importantly, I want to bring your attention to the number of Filipinos in combination. What does that mean? the number of Filipinos that responded multiracial on the census form. And if you remember, um, since 2000 census, the census allows the respondents to respond more than one race on the census form. And this is important because uh, like the Japanese and the Filipinos uh, among all the Asian groups are the, the largest multiracial and the Filipino tend to respond uh, multi-racial and uh, can't worry. What does that mean? So for example, on the census form, if you check or I check Filipino and then you'll be counted Filipino alone, but you also check whether you're black or white or uh, Filipino and then with Korean or, or Chinese or you know, because some people have uh, a bicultural uh, parents, or, uh, for example, and then they will be counted as a Filipino income in any combination. And you can see there's a huge difference between the Filipino alone and Filipino in combination. There, if you look at some other groups, for example, the Vietnamese, uh, very much, you know, 54,000 compared to 59,000, or the Korean and so on and so forth, very pretty close, but the Filipino and the Japanese population stand out as having the, uh, the largest uh, multiracial re uh, responses. Next. Now, if we look at this county, um, and we can see that Winnet now has the largest Filipino population, um, uh, uh, and then followed by Cobb, Fulton, and Decap. So these are three, four major metropolitan uh, counties uh, in the state of Georgia with, uh, with high concentration of Filipinos. Next. Um, again, and then just this slide, just sort of implementary to the previous slide, just saying the Fulton now taking over um, as the second largest uh, uh, county with the la second largest Filipino population. Next. And if we take a look at, <clears throat> at the city, however, and that surprised me too, Augusta, Richmond County, that area had the largest uh, concentration of Filipinos and followed by the city of Atlanta and Johns Creek and Columbus. I know that May um, talked about the bus tour earlier, and these are the spots that we want to hit and want to reach out to the population, uh, the Asian population in general. But there's also there's some areas that we feel like uh, we need to do some more outreach in order to have a, a, a better complete count of the Asian population. Next. That takes us to 2020 census. So the question would be, <clears throat> um, 
uh, as Eleanor has eloquently showed us earlier, uh, a lot of uh, promotional outreaches. Uh, and this time, Tina is going to talk and share with you more about uh, some of the operations uh, of the 2020 census and how we can better reach out and pro promote and encourage the Filipinos to, to respond. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Luke. So, takes us to 2020 census. And I have a short video to share with you. And so this will be a very quick 101 census. And that's pretty much the census 101. So just a little bit history. Um, like the video said, it starts back in 1790s um, where we conduct the headcount. count. That's the first ever census for our um, country. And on that count, we counted 3.9 million inhabitants, right? Back in that day, can you imagine drop walking around and riding horses trying to count everyone back in the day but that was the first number that we had and so moving to 2020 we see how much things have changed our community our um, population grow and so it's important that we can accurate count because like the video say we use census data in everything from um, representation in Congress to to providing essential data for community planning, even impacting our community um, where $675 billion in federal funding for important programs is um, distributed each year to our community based on the census number, right? And so a lot of those communities include education, uh, employment, even, you know, of course, you know, highway planning, construction infrastructure. And so it's very important that our community get the fair share of representation, but more importantly, the $675 billion a year for our community so that we can help our community grow. One of the things that the uh, community, um, the video touched on, and I know our community is concerned about is privacy and confidentiality. Um, I know Isa said earlier about the, uh, the law under um, US Code Title 13, 
we are bound by this law to not share your individual respondent data to anyone, right? And so your information is kept safe. We would never share your personal information with other agency, um, other individuals. And so like FBI, for example, or ICE, I know there's a lot of fear, but your information is kept safe. Um, under that law, for example, Luke and I, before we even start our job, we have to swear and sign this oath where we will keep your information safe for the rest of our life. It's not until this job ends and I go and I accidentally, you know, know someone's information and then share it to anyone. No, we keep it to the grave. And so if we accidentally share that person's information, it's the the fine for that is, of course, up to five years imprisonment and our fine of $250,000. I can assure you, I don't have that money and I don't want to wear orange. It's not a good color for me. And I'm sure Luke <laughs> feel the same way too. So it's something that um, we want to let our community know your information is kept secure and safe. Um, how will the census invite everyone to respond? Well, there are three ways that you can fill out the census um, form. One way, of course, is by mail. Everyone should have received a paper form by this time already. Um, if you like, of course, and if you sometimes like me, you don't read the mail, you throw it away accidentally, you can also call into the census number. We have um, various lines with various language, um, the 12 languages. One of them is, of course, include Tagalog, right? As well as English for those of um, whichever language you prefer. Another way that's convenient, of course, is online. If you go to my2020census.gov, you can fill the census out. It's very um, quick, easy. It's maximum 10 minutes per person. And so you can fill it out quickly and finish it within um, 10 minutes or, or less. Let's talk a little bit about the census self-response rate. Um, I want to mention this just because um, this is what we want to show how our community has responded. So at a national level, um, Households that have responded is about 62.1% as of yesterday, July 15th. And so for the state of Georgia, we have a, about 70, sorry, 57.9% of households that have responded. So we're missing um, 43, really, right? Well, 42. Um, households that have not responded. So if you think about the number of people living in the state of Georgia and you think about the impact of funding, that's a large number of households that have not responded and we want to make sure that our community is counted. And if you look closely at the top five county where Filipino community reside in Winnet, Fulton, Cobb, DeKalb, and Chatham, um, if you see it in Winnet, we're doing very well um, at 65% per se, but we want to make sure that it's pushed to 70 at least, right? Or 80% so that we get, the higher is the better, right? So that we get that accurate count. Um, if you look at the CD level, um, the top five cities where with the largest Filipino community resides in Augusta, Richmond, number one, they're performing at 55.9%. So about 45% of the community has not responded. And so we want to make sure that for the next few weeks, we push that response rate up, encouraging our community, if you know people who live in these cities, ask them if they responded yet. And then of course, engage them, encourage them to respond because we want to make sure that we get a fair count, an accurate count so that we get our fair share of representation as well as the funding for our community. One of the things that I want to let everyone know is of course, a non-response follow-up operation is about to start in August 11th. What does that mean? It means that from now until August 11th, you have an opportunity to self-response by phone, by online, or through the paper form that you receive. Um, in August, on August 11th, households that have not responded 
we'll have census takers go and knock on your doors um, and ask you to fill out the, the census in person. And so for those of you who are like me, don't like opening doors, don't like talk, you know, opening doors, and then especially in this environment also too, where we kind of want to keep ourselves safe at home, it's best that we fill out the census um, online through the phone or by mail um, through the self-response. But if you don't respond, um, the census tickers will come and visit those who have not responded, okay? Um, one thing we want to ask you is that you challenge your network. Um, share the news of the census, why it's important, and of course, make sure that everyone is counted. And I think that's it. If you have any questions or um, anything, you can feel free to email me or Luke as well, of course, you know, wait until later. And I think we have a Q&A session coming up too. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent, uh, Tina and Luke Wen. Thank you so much for that very, very informative, you know, um, um, all updates regarding the census 2020. Um, uh, again, I would just want to, um, you know, to do a shout out, you know, to the panelists, I'm sorry, to the attendees, the live attendees, you know, and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the attendees that we have in the chat uh, reply to, you know, to answer the call to action. Let's be counted, you know, and let's do it now. You know, uh, it only takes a few minutes. So how about having some fun at this moment, you know, to have, you know, just before the interaction part, we have prepared for you a fun, you know, experience through a, a trivia game, okay? Um, I will turn it over to Fran Tianco to again, uh, give us the eligibility requirements, you know, and the rules of the game. Fran? Good evening, everyone. I am your trivia host, Fran Rodrigo Tianco. And you, and I, now I will call out the contestant eligibility requirements for Pabilang Tayo Trivia Contest. Number one, all Makabayan Georgia Inc. or Galing Foundation Inc. members and or their family members are not eligible to participate in this contest. Sorry guys. Pabilang Tayo webinar panelists are not eligible to participate in this contest either. All participating contestants must be Georgia residents. All other live and silent Pabilang Tayo webinar attendees are eligible to participate, granted that requirements one, two, and three are met. Understand? Pabilang Tayo webinar panelists are not eligible to participate in this contest. Participating contestants must be Georgia residents. Okay? Now I'm moving on to contest rules. Contestants can submit an answer only through or by the chat box to all panelists and attendees. Please scroll down to all panelists and, and attendees on your chat box options. So make sure you put it on your chat box options as all panelists and attendees or your answer is not valid. The contestants who submit the correct answers first, at, as it appears on the all panelists and attendees chat box at the earliest clock time and confirmed by our contest umpire, Tony Lutgers, is, the declared, is declared the winner for that question. The winner's names will be announced by me immediately after the umpire, Tony, confirms the correct answer which appears first on the all panelists and attendees chat box at the earliest clock time. Contestants may only win once. There will be four $50 gift cards 
prizes during two intermissions, and this is the first intermission. And any questions? I know it's a lot of rules. Uh, I'll, try, I'll do one sample question. Question one, what year was the first census held and what was the total population count for that census? This was in Tina's um, presentation. I saw it. We have a winner. Yep, we have a winner. Tony? Justin Neely. Justin Neely is the winner of what, Isa? I can't. It's a, it's a Kroger $50 gift card. Thank you, Justin. Congratulations. Congratulations. You're going to Kroger. <laughs> okay, question number two. Who should be counted in the 2020 census? Who should be counted in the 2020 census? You have to be a little bit more specific. <laughs> All right, we have a winner. We have a winner. Go ahead, Fran. Go ahead, Tony. <laughs> okay. The winner is Miss Venus Soriano. Yay, Miss Venus, congratulations. You win a $50 gift card from Lowe's. Okay, that's it for intermission number one and trivia questions. Stay tuned for the next intermission and two more trivia questions. Thank you for participating. That that was fun. Uh, it was a challenge, a, a twister to our, you know, to the genius in you. So congratulations again to the winners. Now we go to the panel discussion. Um, in the panel discussion, we have nine live attendees. They are a good representation of a wide sector of the film community here in Georgia. I, uh... Uh, my name is uh, Joe Villacino, and I am a science educator. Uh, I teach in high school and also a part-time college professor. Uh, my question is uh, for Luke, and of course, it is addressed to all the, the panelists. Uh, one thing that caught my eye is that the census is actually geared for the legislative purposes. So my question is, why is the citizenship question a, controver a controversial question where in fact the aim is for, one of the aims is for legislative purposes? Luke speaking. Okay. Uh, and, and you can see and go back to the history of the Census Bureau and even in the constitution, which is asking for the head count of anyone living, breathing, sleeping most of the time in the United States. So that's the, the very beginning, the founding father is just asking for that. And, um, and if you follow, and then the Census Bureau has responded to this on our website, and you can, I would recommend you to go further um, to census.gov and learn more about that citizenship question and how the census have responded to that. Um, and I also refer you to, you to our public information offices for further information. And I'm not in the position to answer um, say a specific question about citizenship on the census form. Thank you. Sir. All right, thank you. Uh, um, I'd like to comment in that of the questions that is asked on the 2020 census, there is no citizenship questions that is being asked. So we don't have to worry about that question being on the 2020 census um, questionnaire. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Aquino, and thank you, mm -hmm. uh, Tina and Luke for that. Uh, right now, I'd like to give the uh, floor to, I wouldn't just say the Belga sisters. Lorraine and Lorianne. Hi, um, I'm Lorraine. This is Lorianne. Um, 
We, I mean, I'm a, a teacher, um, so we got a lot of information in terms of like having to, you know, um, give information to all of our families and students about the census. Mm -hmm. uh, Lorian, she works, do you want to say what you do? Yeah. Uh, I currently um, serve at a restaurant in Atlanta. Yeah. Um, I mean, off the top of our heads, uh, I don't think we have any questions right now at the moment. Um, but I mean, I will say like this was very informative, um, everything that we just kind of covered. So thank you so much, you know, and uh, please disseminate whatever you learn or whatever information you, you uh, get here to your friends. Thank you to the Belga uh, sisters. Um, right now, I I'd like to turn it over to Stephanie Casaguana. Stephanie. I'm Stephanie Casaguana. I'm a digital marketing expert. Um, I'm also a mom of two rambunctious boys. Um, so my question is for either Tina or Luke. What caught my eye was um, the data around like ethnicity. Um, so in my mind, the census is really about counting people and the age and all that's kind of fun and, and like the politics of everything. Why is ethnicity such an important point that we pull out in the data? It's, this is Luke speaking. And um, if you go again, the first census that took place was 1790. And the very first census we were asking about who, what kind of people are living in the United States already. Now, now, of course, we know that uh, back then they were mostly counted for white people and free slaves, right? Now, the, the history of the United States since ever since the country's brand growing so large, so diverse, so, uh, say, um, so diverse racially and, and ethnically, and there's a need even at the local government to get more accurate statistics about its populations, better understanding of its population. So that comes the question of um, the counting of race and ethnicities in the United States. There's a memo uh, coming out of a 1997 memo coming out from the Office of Management and Budget. Now who determines or who, who set the standards or the definition for determined race and ethnicity in the United States? For the per for statistical purpose only, and then for uniformity and for the uses of the race and ethnicities in reinforcing federal laws or, or monitoring um, federal laws and you know civil rights or, um, or, or the, the the voting rights, for example, right? Um, so there, because of that history, there's a need for the federal government as well as local government to collect more data at this racial and ethnic level. This time, um, I'd like to invite Francis Gallego to ask your question directed to, and please name the panelist. Right. Um, this is Francis Gallego. I'm currently a data scientist over at the Home Depot. I do work related to artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, I've lived in the Atlanta area since I was an infant, and I would, I think this is a question that I feel would be open to all panelists is, what do you think in general causes people from a privacy standpoint to not be comfortable with divulging information about themselves and their families. I know that there's been a lot of talks about uh, privacy breaches, like the one with Equifax about a year ago and information like that. Why do people feel from a privacy standpoint that they don't necessarily want to divulge information about themselves? Yeah, I know that has been asked a lot in our Filipino community. Um, they the concern about any personal data being, um, you know, used uh, against um, the person. And uh, I, uh, well, in our Filipino community, there are some who are uh, not legal, right? <laughs> These are some of our uh, illegal, you know, aliens, so to speak, that 
um, that's one uh, um, sector, I guess, in our community that would not want to participate or, or have expressed, uh, you know, the a fear of that information being used against them. Um, something when we know it's this distrust of the government, but then that's where the trusted voices come in, like Eleanor, for example, who goes and with the um, trusted community leaders and share the message and engage the community, let them know that the information is kept safe, secure, and they how they um, can be counted for community. Um, I'll also share in the chat box, of course, more information um, and the link of how um, the census is keeping your information safe and secure also too, for you to um, follow up and read, Francis. Thank you, Tina. Uh, Luke, when, uh, do you have anything more to say um, on that, on Francis Gallego's question? Hello, this is Luke again. Uh, I uh, very much what Tina had to say. I think that's why we had this uh, of this forum to raise awareness. A lot of times, because people did not understand or do not understand the law and the protection law and the protection of this census data. And remember, when we publish the data, it's statistics. No names or no impersonally identifiable information is being published by the census. So that's important. So that's part of our outreach and promotion. We want to make sure that we, we talk to our population or talk to our community about the uh, confidentiality and the protection of that by law um, that required by all the census employees and the census bureau. Thank you. Excellent discussion on that point. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Francis, for that uh, great question. Uh, now I'd like to turn it over to Butch Granada uh, to ask the question. Butch? Hey, yeah, I'm Butch Granada. I'm a regional manager for a scientific camera uh, sales company for uh, in the semiconductor industry. And I'm probably a... a, a um, Honorary member of PNAGA because I'm always working with them uh, behind the scenes. Um, my question is for Tina. Uh, just I was thinking about the uh, all the data that is coming across in the census. Um, what are some specific benefits of participating in the census? Um, are there things that may benefit like sh social programs or outreach programs or um, representation in government or in ministries or anything like that, other than just data for data's sake, you know, are there specific ways that it can help in uh, promoting programs and outreaches? Okay, okay, great. All right. So the 2020 census pretty much the goal is, of course, allowing us to one be Determine the representation in Congress, right? Of the 435 seats, we want to make sure that Georgia get a fair share of that representation in Congress. But more importantly, $675 billion a year of programs that fund important programs like Medicaid, SNAP, for example, even highway planning and construction. So when you think about if everyone here either take the public transportation or drive on the road, you need to be out the form and be counted because we want to make sure that Georgia, especially here in Atlanta, get their potholes fixed so that we don't have to yeah. hit every single pothole on the road, right? Um, but also too, when I myself come from a public health background as well as nonprofit, and one of the things that I know really important for nonprofit for community is grant funding and so census data are used um, is one, one of the most trusted sources for us to use that to write grants and so for us for example for the Filipino community we if we want to seek community funding to build up our community, right? Then we have to find an accurate count of the Filipino American community here in Georgia and showcase that in the grant, um, in the grant application. 
Same thing with education, for example, it's very important for education also too, for children to be counted so that they can plan, the, the schools um, can plan accurately of, you know, the school's year for the next 10 years. Because you remember the 2020 census is once in a decade, right? So the next time we can change our number, get an accurate count again is 2030, like Isa said earlier. And so we want to make sure that our children is counted, especially children um, five, uh, five and below, because from children between zero and five is our hardest to count population. We miss over a million children in 2010. So if you think about planning for kids for the classroom and you plan, let's say, um, you count in the 2010 census, 100 kids in your um, county, let's say, and you plan for 100 kids, and 200 show up, you have resource problem, right? And you have students uh, learning in a trailer, right? So that's what is really important that we can accurate count for a community with all these various benefits. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Tina. Uh, thank you, Butch, for that question. Uh, now we go to Anne-Marie Lagarda uh, with her, her question. Go ahead, Anne-Marie. Hi, um, I'm Anne-Marie Lagarda. I'm a lawyer by profession, both here in the U.S. and in the Philippines. I represent the Philippine American Chamber of Commerce of Georgia. I'm the uh, current president and I chair the Kalayaan Committee or the Philippine Independence Day Organizing Committee. My question is directed to Tina or Luke. Um, you know, Eleanor May presented uh, several pictures uh, and events of events uh, where we were uh, disseminating uh, information about the U.S. Census starting August last year. So at this point in time, we are actually at the last push phase. So with that being said, um, uh, I think that the Filipino Quick Count Committee, uh, uh, kudos to Eleanor May and all the active participants, uh, we have reached a sizable number in so far as affiliated or organized Filipino Americans. So my question is, um, can you share perhaps one or two best practices in terms of how do we reach the unaffiliated Filipino Americans or those who are not formally uh, members of the 30 or so Filipino American organizations in Georgia? Thank you. There are various um, activities that we are conducted um, and of course our partners um, are conducted throughout the states um, from the community um, support from the local churches to of course um, I don't know if anyone knows this but we also have national partnerships also too and one of the things that I noticed the other day when I got um, I order from Starbucks was Literally in the app, it reminded everyone about the 2020 census. So there are various um, activities going on in all around you also too. Um, some of the ways that we know is, of course, the best way is through word of mouth. And so that's why having social media push also is a, a huge um, activity for the community to do. Um, everyone is connected to everyone to another person, right? And so if everyone here on the program can share um, the importance of the census with your friends and family and ask them to do the same with their friends and family, and then I think you can see the ways of connection. And so um, that's one of the activities that we know has been going very well, and we you know, want to encourage everyone to share that census messaging. Um, another way, of course, is um, coming from the, the, the faith-based leader also too, where we know a lot of faith be, lay, 
faith-based leaders have a lot of connection and outreach and weight really the trusted voice and community having them share the census message the encouragement to their own congregation members and then ask those members to share with their friends and family also too so those are some of the ways that um, I know can um, have an impact and has made an impact okay Thank you, Tina. Uh, Lou, would you like to say something in addition to that? Well, sure. Um, I think the question is specifically asking about what's the best way to uh, uh, to outreach unaffiliated, non-affiliated members. So uh, I think what makes the Filipino community sort of different from other Asian group is that the Filipinos are among the multiracial groups, meaning there's a lot of cross-cultural, cross-interracial marriages among the Filipinos. I, I believe that's its advantage. Now, the Census Bureau has identified the hard to count populations and Asian ethnic groups are the hard to count population. But here's the advantage is that among the Filipinos community, Beside those uh, affiliated um, or organized, uh, organized communities or groups, and you can reach out to virtually to any platform, even organizations. For example, uh, when we talk about when we approach the, the Archdiocese of Atlanta, for example, uh, we of course reach out to Hispanics across the board because we know there's a lot of them as Hispanic. So same thing with Filipinos. Now we can go to a not traditional, um, uh, say, venues such as the, the Archdiocese, for example, as a way to reach out to, say, non or unaffiliated members of the community, just as an example. Now we go to another a young uh, fellow, you know, Justin Neely. Uh, please tell us about yourself and um, go ahead and ask your question. Justin? All right, hello, uh, my name is Justin. I am a high school student at Alliance Academy for Innovation, and um, I don't really have any questions, but, uh, well, actually, I wanted to know how, how does having an accurate count uh, help the community? The um, benefits that I, can do, uh, I know can impact community is, business planning, right? So if any young leaders out there who want to become entrepreneur, you need that data to see and of course plan for, you know, building your own business. And one of the things I know, I think um, there's a very popular Filipino restaurant that I heard, I think it was, it was it Jelly Bean? <laughs> Jelly Bean. Um, yeah, yes, right. And so that's one of the things that, um, that I know the community is thinking of and pushing for. And so if you, you know, one of the engagement, I know Eleanor keep um, talking about it. If we have a larger population of the community here, we can get them to come here. Right. And so that's the goal for, of course, that 2020 census accurate count that she was aiming for with the community, complete count committee. But, but, you know, one of the things that, you know, we want to come back into this is that representation, right? Making sure that the representation of the Filipino community is there. And of course, bringing back that, um, the fair share of um, that funding for our community also too, okay? Thank you. Yay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Justin, for that. Now, um, I'd like to, um, give the floor to one of our community leaders, well-known leaders, uh, Venus Soriano. Venus? Hi, my name is Venus Soriano. I am a um, semi-retired registered nurse, and uh, I belong to lots of foundations and uh, organization here in Georgia. Um, before my question, um, the question of Francis Gallego is really very important because uh, the problems that I myself encountered during doing the census 2020 is to get the trust from the people. So I guess uh, the bureau, the census, the 2020 census bureau or the bureau needs really to attack that problem, the trust. And I bet you once we get that trust from them, then the census will really be improved. So this is just, I'm just talking to all 
to uh, Luke and Tina that trust really needs to be concentrated. So to get that um, uh, a feeling from the people to uh, feel in the census 2020. My question is to for Tina. You said Gwinnett has a response of 65.6. Is that a, a response from all Asian or is that a response from the Filipino American? So um, thank you for that uh, comment questions. Um, so that is the response rate of the total households that is counted in um, Gwinnett County. So the race questions, we don't have that data available as of yet. And we, we I don't think they'll share that also too. Um, but for the response rate, it is um, for the households. So we don't have any, you don't have any recent uh, response, census response for the Filipino American, right? Is that correct? Yes, that data is not available. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Question for that data not going to be available at all? Que good question. That part I don't know, um, but I, I know it's not being shared with um, us at this time. But uh, right now, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Chris Villianco, one of our, of course, frontliners, you know, in the pandemic. Uh, Chris, go ahead and tell us about yourself and how you've um, coped, you know, with the, uh, with the turbulent times that we live in now. Chris, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, just to introduce myself, my name is Chris Villianco. I'm a medical doctor completing my psychiatry training at Morehouse School of Medicine here in Atlanta. Um, I went to school at Emory, so I've been in Atlanta for a really long time. Um, I just wanted to first say thank you for even having this uh, Zoom session. Um, it makes me proud as a Filipino American to be a part of it. I'd also like to give a shout out to all my cousins who are listening on the Zoom call, even if you're not from Georgia, I love you guys too. Um, I'm sorry you can't win any uh, fun fact games. Um, and so I actually had two questions. Um, one I wanted to ask as a doctor and then I'll take off my doctor hat or my white coat. And uh, the second question I'll ask as a person of color or a minority in this country. So first question as a doctor, I just wanted to ask, how is the census data going to be utilized to improve health care at the uh, community local level um, once we have the data? And then um, the second question, being a minority and person of color, um, I know that we're kind of moving towards using more online and electronic forms of creating the census. In addition to COVID, I just kind of wanted to, I wanted to ask, um, how do you guys expect that will affect maybe some minorities and low income and low socioeconomic status minorities with the data that's gonna come in this year? And uh, anybody can answer it. Uh, so uh, that's it, thank you. The questions of um, how census data impact the local health care. One of the things that we know is that census data are used in local planning in all ways. And so hospital planning is key, right? And what they need to know is how many people is in their service region, right? So that they can actually plan for hiring enough doctors, emergency responders to um, serve the community. And so if you don't respond accurately in that area, then we see longer wait time, of course, for the, um, at the doctor office, not having enough um, doctor, physician, and of course, the central health workers to serve the community. And so that's one of the, one, one, one of the um, very important factor of census data being used in determining the healthcare planning at the local level. And then, I'm sorry, can you repeat the second question? Yeah, sorry. Um, you're so focused on the first one. Um, <laughs> so my question was, you know, being a minority a person of color, I know with the 2020 census, some changes that we made were we're moving more to online for the data gathering. And then also for, you know, more physical ways that we would usually do it, COVID has kind of ruined our plans for that. So I kind of wanted to know from the, you know, the Census Bureau, 
how do you think that those things are going to affect you know, low um, socioeconomic minorities and communities because uh, we don't want them to be underrepresented in this very important time. All right. So historically, those community has always been a challenge. They're a hard, what's called hard to count community. And so that's why we work together with local community leaders to push out the message, uh, message um, back in 2018 and of last year and then of this year. Um, and so we work together to increase the trust in community and try to engage community uh, members to respond to the census. That being said, this year is the first time the census is available online and through the phone. And so we actually provide more options for the community to respond. Um, originally in 2010, it was still the paper form. In 2020, we still have that paper form, but we also allow the community to call in through the phone so they can call in, answer the question. The, on the other line, the census takers will record their um, answers, right? And then of course, also online um, for easier and quicker um, responses. And so I think having options is great. Um, I don't know about other people, but you know, for those of um, us who are more comfortable with the paper form, that option was available and it was sent to the, the households that have not responded um, if they chose not to respond um, via phone or mail. That being said, if by August 11th, households that have not responded, we will have census taker coming out in person, knocking on the stores. And so by that time, if you have not responded, um, be sure to be on the lookout for those census taker and please open the door and participate. Um, and we'll do the interview in person. And so that's our, those are the different ways that you can respond to the census and how we can get an accurate count for this community. Well, healthcare companies uh, would use the uh, population statistics to help plan for the uh, um, building new hospitals and clinics or expanding existing ones. That's one of one important point. Okay, thank you, Eleanor. Uh, Luke, uh, would you like to weigh in on um, Dr. Villanca's questions? Definitely. Uh, I mean, I can go nonstop, but I just give you a few examples because I work with the students at Emory. I taught them uh, the Emory Nursing School and Emory Public Health School. And just to give some example of how these students utilize the data in serving the community, uh, Emory has a program called uh, Farm Workers and uh, Farm Worker in South of Georgia, where, where they go in there learning about community demographics and they design a better health initiative program to help these migrant workers that work in, in the farm in South of Georgia, for example. And here in Metro Atlanta, community of colors actually using this kind of data in in uh, uh, in in order to design health prevention programs. Uh, I know the Vietnamese uh, organization called BPSOS and CPEX have their own community clinic. They get the data from the census, and from that data, they may proposal to government agency to get more funding to go back to serve these vulnerable communities because uh, the social economic data shows the, the disparities in terms of access to healthcare, for example, language barrier, for example. These data help them to make the case. So just two examples to, to illustrate the point. So thank you to the distinguished panelists and thank you to the live attendees, you know, for the, you know, for the wonderful interaction. We would like to hear from our beloved executive director, Galene Foundation um, of Galene Foundation Incorporated, uh, Tony Lutgers for a short message to everyone. Thank you, Isa, for inviting me to say a few words to our community on behalf of Galene Foundation. It's great to be with all of you. Galene Foundation Incorporated is a 501c3 nonprofit charitable organization based in Georgia, whose mission is to serve as partner in building a legacy of hope by transforming the new generation through the power of literacy and by sharing God's love 
to all. I personally wish to thank Makabayan Georgia for giving us the opportunity to be part of the U.S. Census Filipino Complete Count. Through, through your generosity, GFI has been on board with this project since fall of 2019, engaging with the community at the Philam Greater Atlanta Fall Picnic in Norcross, the Filipino American History Month Symposium in Moro, and at the Couples for Christ meeting in Athens. Thanks to Ms. May Pasqual, Attorney Anne-Marie Lagarta, Randy Cabano, Grace Rageb, and the rest of the committee for all their hard work and dedication. While COVID-19 pandemic has impacted in our, our, uh, our in-person effort, we at GFI are doubling up on our strategic approach, utilizing social media platforms and today's webinar to reach out to members of our community to drive the message home. Pabilang po tayo. Let's be counted. And more follow-up programs are being discussed to further increase Georgia's response rate, which is currently at almost 58%. This U.S. Census count is first and foremost a mandate of the U.S. Constitution, a very important piece of our democracy. To our Kababayans, it's time, it's time, not only to have a conversation about inclusion and diversity, but to actually exercise our right to truly be visible, to be counted and not undercounted. We strongly encourage everybody from young ones to the little ones, and all the way to our seniors living in every household to be counted. This census means funding for schools, senior programs, hospitals, infrastructure, healthcare, and programs and services for the common good, as well as proper representation in Congress. The data gathered will help lawmakers create and improve policies and business will depend on this data and demographics to help decide future investments. We have the power to shape our future. As a Filipino community in Georgia, our vote and our needs matter. This is an opportunity that we must all participate and do our part. Wouldn't you like to be counted and represented? For those who may need assistance, we at Pabilang Tayo, U.S. Census Filipino Complete Count, are here to help. So please feel free to contact any of us. Finally, many thanks to our Philippine Honorary Consul General in Atlanta, Ray Donato, our keynote speaker, attorney Marvin Lim, esteemed members of the panel, leaders in the community, and the Pabilang Tayo Planning Committee. Thank you for all your help. We look forward to your support this 2020 and in the 2030 U.S. Census count. Magandang gabi po sa inyong lahat at marami pong salamat. Good evening to all and thank you so much and please stay safe. And now let me turn you over to Honorary Consul General Ray Donato for his video message. I am my fellow Kababayans. In cooperation with the uh, Galing Foundation and Makabayan of Georgia, we have been trying to be an advocacy for pushing our Filipino Americans to register for the census, which is a 10 year uh, count of the population of the United States, which is now in 2020, uh, for you to register if you have not yet registered. This is important, mga kababayans, because of the racial and ethnic uh, categories designation of the census. We would then know exactly how many philams there are in the United States and especially in Georgia where we all live. Currently, we have about 329 million people in the United States, counting everybody, of course. And the world population, as you may know, is about 7.6 billion. The results of the population, how many people we are uh, by count, determine how many seats in Congress each state gets. It also determines how much federal tax dollars are allocated to our state of Georgia, which could be in the billions of dollars. 
This is used for healthcare, nonprofit organizations, the performing arts and culture, and many other needs of society. The census, for your information, influences policies that impact everyday lives, including decisions that are made in education, transportation, health and housing, and even environmental preservation. Through this knowledge, officials can know how to handle our better sanitation, effective transportation, business needs, schools and hospitals, highways and many more. So important that you, if you have not registered yet, uh, register for the census so that we are counted as films in the state of Georgia. And then we have also a voting power, whether whatever party you belong in. So, mga kabayan, I ask you to please register if you have not registered once more uh, in the census that's ongoing right now. I think it ends in April, but there is a continuation uh, online uh, and in person for you to fill up. So uh, we want to thank also Makabayan of Georgia again and the Galing Foundation for pushing this advocacy to register for the national census of 2020. Maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat and of course, Please continue to stay safe. Uh, we have a pandemic going on, and I know that sometimes it feels that we have a normal life, but we are going through a crisis at this particular uh, time of the year. So stay safe, be healthy, and all the best wishes to all of you. Marami salamat po. So Fran, go ahead. Let's do the rest of the slides again. Brains. Hello, everybody. So just to jump right in, I'm going to do question three. Everybody answer again on the all panelists and attendees uh, chat box. Question three, what are three ways an individual can respond to the 2020 census? The winner is Anne-Marie Logarta. Congratulations. And Congratulations, Anne-Marie. You win a $50 Kroger gift card. So you can go and shop. Thank you. At Kroger. Question number four. What is the official date that the Census 2020 takers will knock on the doors of non-responders? Hmm. And if you don't know the answer, you can Google it because it's pretty tough. We right. have a correct answer. Yes. Go ahead, friend. Okay. It's Lorraine Belga. Woohoo! Congratulations. Very good. Who doesn't love Walmart? So congratulations to Lorraine Belga. You win a $50 gift card from Walmart. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Dee Dee O'Connor, the um, chairman of the board of Makabayan Georgia Incorporated. Ate Didi, Dita Didi, Didi, you know, take it away. But you know, Ralph and I submitted our forms, even though we're seniors and sometimes we forget, okay? The census forms. My name is Didi O'Connor. I came to the United States to Madison, Wisconsin, 51 years ago with Ralph. And we came to Georgia 37 years ago. Ralph to work at CDC and I to work at Emory, where I worked for 20 years in biochemical research and retired in 2002. Currently, I am the chairman of the Board of Directors of Makabayan, Georgia, a 501c3 Filipino American Foundation based in Georgia. And our mission is to make a difference in the Filipino community. Early this year, I had the pleasure of meeting a rising leader in the 
Filipino American community in Georgia. And tonight, I am happy to have the honor of introducing this new leader of his generation, Marvin Lim. A talented, bright, and compassionate young man, Marvin Lim of Norcross at 36 years of age, is a civil rights attorney and the presumptive state representative elect for Georgia House District 99, which comprises unincorporated Norcross, Lilburn, Tucker, in Gwinnett County, Georgia. Marvin was born in Quezon City, grew up in Rizal, and attended Montessori for a couple of years. His father from Pangasinan and his mother from Rizal in the Philippines both worked at Meralco then. Along with his brother, they all immigrated to the United States, settling in Atlanta in 1991. A former recipient of public assistance before becoming a citizen, and then after becoming a citizen, wrongfully flagged as ineligible to vote, Marvin ultimately graduated from Emory University with the distinct honor of magna cum laude, and later attended Yale Law School. He was also a U.S. Fulbright Scholar at the University of the Philippines, which also happens to be my alma mater. Currently, Marvin works on gun violence, prevention issues with the Gifford's Law Center, and works on election law and other cases for Holcomb and Ward LLP co-led by State Representative Scott Holcomb, District 81. And he was legislative counsel with the ACLU of Georgia, a Gruber Fellow, and counsel with the Brennan Center for Justice. Other things he is passionate about are volunteering with the Gwinnett Community Emergency Response Team, Hospice Atlanta, and the Crisis Te Text Line. And he is the board member of 159 Georgia, together which promotes civic education and voter registration. And lastly, he is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Mga kababayan, I am very proud to introduce to you Marvin Lim, the presumptive state representative elect for Georgia, House District 99. Marvin? Salamat. It was such a pleasure to meet your acquaintance and I thank you in particular for your very early support as a Filipino American and a Georgian of, of my campaign. So thank you for introducing me. That was an honor for me. Uh, Marvin Lim. I am Marvin Lim. Uh, as Didi mentioned, I am a civil rights attorney and technically the Democratic candidate for state representative in House District 99, which is in unincorporated Norcross, Lilburn Tucker in Gwinnett County. It's right on the border between Gwinnett and DeKalb. But as there is no general election opponent, I am the presentative state representative elect for this district. Uh, I've lived here in this district since 2001, 10 years after my family. As Didi mentioned, my brother, mother, father, and I moved from the Philippines in 1991 uh, when I was seven years old. And Didi also mentioned where I was born and where my mom is from in Binangon and Rizal. Um, both my mom and my dad were from very agricultural families. They met while working at Meralco, which is the electric corporation in the Philippines. And I wanted to talk particularly about their backgrounds or re-emphasize it because as you may have seen, or hopefully you saw the title of my remarks tonight are uh, lessons from my uncle's run for barangay captain in the Philippines. And it's my brother's, uh, my mother's brother, Tito Jimmy, who is the uncle I'm talking about uh, in Binangona. And it's his story and not just his run for local office, but his entire life story really that 
tells to me not only my story, but it really, there are many themes you can pull about why the census here in America, thousands of miles away, is important, including for us Filipino Americans. Now, as far as my own personal story, I want to talk about my uncle because of the very important role he played in my life. My mom and dad were both working parents, and because of the very poor schools around us in Rizal, they were spending a lot of their money to send me and my brother to private school, but because they were both working and because of, if you live there, Manila traffic, it really took many relatives to help, including my uncle who would uh, drive me and my brother every single day all the way across town and pick us up and drive us back. Um, so when my family had a chance to come to the US, I was frequently grateful, not just for my parents, but also for my Uncle Tito Jimmy because of the early role he played in my education. So that's my personal story. But I think, again, what does my uncle have to do with the census? That starts to tell the story there. Um, when my family moved here, part of the reason was because they assumed that any school here would be good, and it was not. The first school we ended up at, which was in DeKalb County, was very underfunded. And again, that was something we could not afford private school here, and we certainly did not have any family here. We did not have my uncle or anyone to help us out, including to drive us anywhere. So we eventually, a few years later, would move and pay for a more expensive apartment in a better school district so my brother and I could go to a better school. Now in Georgia, certainly local property taxes play a role in how good one school is, but the process of school resource allocation actually starts at the state. It's called the Quality Basic Education Formula. We're not gonna get into that here. It looks at the economics, population, and other indicators of each local area to see where it needs to allocate the money. And those indicators are collected in part from the census. So if you care about ensuring that your kid's school get the most funding, and by the way, Tina already talked about this, but I wanted to emphasize the point, the census is important for schools. But let's go back to my uncle for a second. Now, clearly he was a very hardworking man and beyond being very hardworking, he's one and continues to be one of the few of my family members who pays attention to what's happening locally in the Philippines and across the world. A lot of my relatives there in the Philippines, including those who have received a great deal of higher education, like one of my aunts, she works at the University of Santa Tomas. Uh, they're actually turned off somewhat understandably from paying attention to public affairs because the Philippines, they're turned off by corruption and various sort of other problems. But to my uncle in Binagonan, yeah, he was angered by a lot of the same things, but he wanted to do something about it. And that's why over 20 years ago now, he ran for barangay captain. And most, if you don't know, barangay is essentially the smallest official unit of municipality with uh, government representation. Uh, it's kind of like a village government is the way I describe it. Um, and neither my dad or my mom's side of my family comes from the political dynasties that fill the many parts of Filipino government. And certainly my uncle wouldn't have had much success running for higher office anyway, or a very poor family we came from. But he didn't even want to necessarily run for higher office because he knew that the issues that needed to be addressed were the most local issues. And the issues being faced in Binangon to this day Sure, especially because of what's going on in the Philippines, there are a lot of concerns about national politics, but in Binangonan, they're most concerned every day about the fact that the, the municipality, the barangay, doesn't pick up trash or they don't enforce ordinances on trash burning that's causing issues uh, with people's asthma. Uh, the barangay there, as of last week, there are four people there with COVID-19 and the municipality is struggling with how to do anything short of a complete lockdown. And all of those issues are issues that would certainly be helped not with national government necessarily intervening directly, but by the barangay receiving more resources. And that very much emphasizes why obviously it's important for us that we have a chance here with the census to get those resources for us. The whole point of that is to get an official count and data on what's happening, yeah, locally, uh, nationally, but also locally what's happening so that we can get those resources here. 
But again, back to my uncle, I'm gonna keep pivoting back to my uncle. Now, as far as his campaign, he did everything he was supposed to do. He ran around, he gathered support, he ran on a platform of providing better services, but fast forwarding through the particulars to the very end, he lost by, it was less than 20 votes, I believe, after all of that work. And sad to say, there was certainly a measure of corruption there, particularly allegations of, of vote buying. And I don't condone that, but I did want to say, it's amazing to me that even in the Philippines, at the smallest levels of government, there can be such passion. I compare it to the US, where, yeah, there might be a few people con concerned about local elections, but I will say in my district, House District 99, in 2016, only 38% of all eligible voters even voted, and that was a presidential election. Compare that to the national average, which is already low of 60%. You're not even going to get that much concern uh, with local elections if you extrapolate from that fact, that fact. And another part of the message there is, and Tina also talked about this earlier too, is that the census will determine where electoral lines are drawn. And I will say in this district where I am, again, House District 99, after 2010, there was reapportionment of the lines based on what the census said. And what ended up happening, it was a very politicized process. They ended up giving less power to the minorities in the boundaries right beyond my district uh, by packing in the minorities into this district. So there are a lot of minorities and immigrants here, but that actually means that there's less representation overall between the two districts for the minorities. And it's something that's very important because there are a lot of, uh, Tina used this term earlier, too hard to count. This is a very hard to count district for several reasons. There's a lot of renters here. One in four households have limited English proficiency. There are a lot of immigrants, over 50%, in fact, immigrants from uh, Latin America, Asia, uh, Africa. But it would be much less possible to dilute our political power if we had more of those people. Again, it's hard to count, but if we could get over that hump and people filled out the census, they wouldn't be able to dilute the political power of the minorities here. But you know, speaking of sort of nefarious or corrupt purposes, I do want to use that as an opportunity to address, and we've already addressed that a little here, about why a lot of people, particularly Filipino Americans, won't fill out the census. And, and that is fear. And again, in part because of my family's own perception of the government in the Philippines, when we came to the US, our first opportunity to fill out the census was in 2000, because we came in 91. And my parents did not want to fill it out. They were very suspicious. And ultimately, it was my brother and me who helped fill it out. Ayaw din nila completo yung census kasi akala nila da gagamitin nila yung information para sa, you know, itrack kami. Pero hindi yung totoo. It was not true that that was information was going to be used to track us, but that certainly deterred uh, my parents. And again, for some people, especially those who are TNT, Tago and Tago, the undocumented, the fear is understandable. I think it's important to recognize that, to not just throw away why people are fearful of that. Now, I can reiterate, as others have, there is no citizenship question on the census this year. Your data is absolutely protected. And from what my research, there is no case of census data at the individual level ever being used for any uh, bad purposes. So yes, there is corruption and whatnot here in the US as well, but that is not one of the bad things happening here in, in the US. And kung ano man ang takot ninyo sa tungkol sa census, hindi ko sasabihin na wala na wala kayong dahilan, pero sinasabi ko ngayon na wala, mas maraming dahilan para i-fill out yung census ninyo. There are many more reasons to fill out the census than to be afraid of it. And I've already talked about the resources. We've already talked about the resources. We've already talked about the elections. Um, and the data point I wanted to point out as well, because um, I want to mention that again in HD 99, a, a few more statistics, we're 85% minorities. I already mentioned over 50% of us are immigrants. Um, a lot of some Filipino Americans, many, many uh, for, for both Lucantina, many Vietnamese residents, 
one in four are below federal poverty levels. 42% uh, of the people don't have health care insurance. 66% uh, of the people are not only renters, but working in general labor jobs, construction service. Um, and I can only rattle all that off because of the census. All of that data is gathered from the census. And I use that data to get more resources to this community. I've already had some success at the local level with code enforcement. And that's because I can rattle off all that data. And so that's another reason, of course, why the census is important. But if you don't care about resources, you should. If you don't care about elect electoral representation, you should. If you don't care about data, you should. But I, I will give you one more reason and I'll pivot back to my uncle one more time. Um, he lost that election. Um, we talked about sort of the corruption around it, but despite that, he remains a very proud Filipino. Yeah, he was turned off by politics, but he continues to vote. He continues uh, to fill out the census in the Philippines. And, and we can do that here too. And I think it's as important as anything I've already mentioned, because we need to show how large we are as a group, how large we are as Filipino Americans. We have a chance to show not just nationally, not just in California or New Jersey, or New York, that there are Filipino Americans here and they are willing to speak out. And as Eleanor May especially was discussing, discussing the more Filipino Americans come here, uh, more of them will come here when they know that there are Filipino Americans here. Maybe we'll get like a Jollibee here or not have to travel to Jacksonville or apparently Texas now for that. But that only reason, that only happens if we can attract those Filipino Americans and their money. And that starts with showing that there is a community here. And so to close this out, when I won the election here, to me, it was like a closure of sorts because my uncle who helped us with our education, really, he could not become elected himself, but I was able to carry in a way beyond the finish line, the torch. And like when I passed the bar exam, my uncle cried when he found out. Actually, my, my mom videoed that, so we have video evidence of that. And the barangay there, of course, again, very poor barangay, they were very proud of the representation that I was bringing for them. And I'm hopeful that that is the si same sort of pride that people have, not just in me, certainly, but in Filipino Americans in general. So that, to me, is the call for all of us to fill out the census because I'm just one elected official for two years, hopefully I go beyond that. But the census will determine electoral lines for the next 10 years and it will determine the resources for the next 10 years. And it will determine what the Filipino American population to the rest of Americans looks like for the next 10 years. So para sa akin, ito ang pinaka mga importanteng dahilan para sa fill out yung census. And I hope for you, you will have some of the same reasons as well. Be inspired, not just by me, not just by my uncle, but other Filipino Americans, despite your fear, to recognize why it's so important for us to be represented. So thank you so much for having me here. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Marvin Lim. We are proud of you. Mabuhay ka, you know, and I can assure you, we're here for you. Um, I cannot just let go of this time to give each and everybody an opportunity to respond. Uh, Marvin would like to hear from you. So even if we're late, you know, with this, uh, with this program, this marvelous program, um, anybody uh, who would like to raise a question or say something to Marvin, just please give me a cue by raising your hand. Yes, Anne-Marie, go ahead. Hold on. Marvin, kamusta? Congratulations. Uh, thank you, Galing Foundation, for the opportunity to interact with all the panelists and, of course, with our guest speaker tonight. So you've um, broken the glass ceiling in so far as the Filipino-American community is concerned in um, uh, Georgia. So we're... Congratulations on that. So my question is, where do you see, you know, it's, there, where are we number three in terms of uh, demographics here in, did I get that right? I, I can't remember what was it, number five. So um, 
you know, the, you, you kind of refer to it. If you build it, they will come. So if they're Filipino Americans in Georgia, they will come. Meaning uh, other Filipino Americans will migrate, will move, etc. With that, um, what do you think would is the most pressing, I guess, issue that faces the Filipino American community today, currently? Absolutely. In Metro Atlanta or in Georgia? Absolutely. I think to me, you could break it down into several things, but I will start with we do, we have an opportunity to be a greater part of the fabric of society, and that certainly includes uh, politics. Um, whatever party you are participating in things like the census and the elections are important uh, for many reasons beyond just trying to influence a certain outcome, because even the representation itself, when people see that you're out there, they see that you are important. And for me, even in my district, you know, I could look at the list and I could see Filipino names and I knew they were there. But I will say in my community, even though the numbers might be there, Vietnamese people are sort of more prominent in the community. Uh, Hispanic people are more prominent in the community. So it's hard for me, even as a Filipino people, to find them. But if they were raising their voice, if we we're all raising our voice, then I think we would be taken seriously, not just in politics, but in the, vari the variety of ways that we can be involved in society, whether you are interested in policy or whether you're a small business owner or whether you're working hard as a laborer in a certain industry and have concerns. But the flip side of that, again, is, yeah, we should participate more that because to me, voting and participation is the thing that addresses all of the issues, whether you care about, you know, lots of Filipino Americans might care about human trafficking or they might care about the economy, but participation is the key to that. But the flip side to that is, again, I want to recognize, I understand why people don't participate. I will say, and Didi mentioned earlier when I was wrongfully flagged as a citizen, you know, my mom, when she registered first, she also had some issues and then sort of the elections didn't go her way and she was like why would i do this and on top of sort of the fear that we have and i won't mention who they are but i know people who are tnt as well so i i understand the fear and more broadly the lack of uh desire to want to raise your voice um, I, I do, again, I want to recognize that. I think it's important that we don't just throw that away. And I think though, beyond recognizing it, if we can address the concerns that people have and start to provide the services for them, because when you break down why people are fearful, but there, yeah, there's the general fear, but there's a specific consequence for them. Again, they might care about their immigration status, but they might care about their livelihood, or they might care about their trying to start a small business, or they might care about they're starting to have a more prominent role in the community. Why speak up at all about controversial issues, whether that's the census or not? But I think that we need to provide, we need to figure out, break that down more, I suppose I'm trying to say, as to why any particular person might be afraid, particularly a Filipino American might be afraid to speak out. All that really can be encapsulated in civic engagement, but I think they're certainly done certainly a great deal of work and hopefully can contribute to that work as well. But to me, if we can start to address those issues, we can tackle various aspects of the issues any one person might care about. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank, that was a very inspiring uh, story from uh, Marvin Lim. Again, uh, remember, you can count on us, you know, just let us, give us a shout out. And um, at this time, I'd like to close this, um, this exciting webinar. I, I wish I could do it some more, you know, but uh, my boss is telling me, let's cut, let's cut it, cut it short right now. So um, on behalf of Galeen Foundation and Makabayan, I would like to thank our distinguished panelists, Eleanor May Pasqual, Tina and Luke Wen, you know, for honoring us with their presence, you know, a long presence, you know, in this uh, webinar. Thank you.
most especially also to our live attendees. Um, I will just go ahead and mention your names again because I cannot be so, you know, a privilege and proud to know you and to interact with you. Joe Aquino, Lorraine Belga, and Lorianne Belga, Stephanie Casawana, Francis Gallego, Butch Granada, Anne Marie Logarda, Justin Neely, Venus Soriano, Chris Villanco, and of course to our trivia winners, you will hear from us, you know, definitely from me, you know, but uh, my shout out on behalf of the team is let's be counted. You know, and because each of us matters. So let's do our civic duty. With that, you know, I end the program. Maraming salamat po. Mabuhay kayong lahat. Mabuhay ang Amerika. Mabuhay ang Pilipinas. Thank you.